The goal has changed. I've come to realize, no, no, it's not working that way. My goal is now to be the best human being I can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I think I think what you touched on is 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 quite interesting because if someone is happens to be listening to you and watching this right now and they have that little question in their head that says am i an alcoholic do i need to get help um why am i watching to me and mr d right now what would you say to somebody like that who hasn't had um the opportunity or um the chance to or who doesn't know that there is a way out, they can find help. What would you say to somebody who, who who's who's listening to this for the first time and is not aware that there is such a thing called alcoholism and addiction and um, there is help? What advice would you yeah. give that person? Well, we don't give advice in the fellowship. What I do is tell them a little bit more of my story. <laughs> and, and the part I would basically share is, is the part where once I had doubted, I, I noticed that I wished to be an, a hard drinker and not an alcoholic, I needed to convince myself that I am. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I, I looked at the step, and step one says, admitted we're powerless over alcohol and our lives have become unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So it said to me, if I am really an alcoholic, one, I need to prove to me that I am powerless. Mm -hmm. So what does powerless mean? It means I don't have control over my drinking. You know, and, and I started going back and looking at my own drinking because it's my track record, which gives me evidence. Mm -hmm. And I realized I never drank I always went to the Shabin and said, I'll, I'll buy two. And I got back at home at two. <laughs> Each time I drank, the aim was just to remove the air, to get that sense of ease and comfort. But every time I drank, I could not. And that for me was very important. Because I started realizing every time I drink, I don't stop because I can't stop. I saw incidences. At one time, I was ready, you know, I was taking my family to Gold Reef City and we were ready. All, I was dressed up and everything and I made the mistake of going out. And the guys were out there in the street mm -hmm. having a few. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, grab one. And I grabbed the one. Mm -hmm. And I never went to Gold Reef City. Because the moment I'd taken the first one, it was like I was planted there. My body said and my mind said, you dare not stop, you continue. The, you know, the, 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 the saddest thing, I never forget about that incident. It was when my son came to me and said, mom is asking for you. And I said, tell your mom I'm not going. Mm -hmm. And I took out my wallet and gave him my card. And I took out the keys of the card and I gave him. And I said, you can use the card and you know, here's the car keys and you can go with your mom. And my son said to me, Baba, there's also alcohol at Gold Rip City. I never forget. I never forget. You know? But that tells me that once I'd taken the first drink, I could not stop. I used to stand at the gate of my house and look at the shibi, you know, and promise myself I'll be back before night so that I can watch some TV with my family and then sleep. I'd always be back at two in the morning. So that was the first part that 
for me was very clear. The second part was my mind was always concocting some trick to make me pick up that question. So what it meant is that, you know, I'm looking at the powerlessness that my body, once I pick up the first one, I can't stop. My mind makes me to drink when I don't want to drink. And there were days when I didn't want to drink. I'd be, I'm supposed to go work. Hmm? And my mind says, oh no, we can just take a little bit and we'll be okay. You know, the Baba loss is a little too much today. And, and I'd, my, I would agree with my mind and take a little bit and then my body would say, you're going nowhere. You're mm -hmm. drinking. And but, there have been times when I've gone to work with a Baba loss and then my mind would say, it's a good idea just to buy one beer. You know, at work. I was a school principal at the time. And so I'd go around as if I'm, I'm, I'm inspecting the, the yard and then eventually I'd end up at the cottage in the schoolyard and there was a security guy there and I'd give him money, you go and buy it. And then, you know, uh, eventually I'd go back to the cottage and then I'd have some. And I never forget a subordinate, she was an HOD, scolding me like a small mm -hmm. child in my own office for being undisciplined, for drinking at work. And so, you see, my body was making me drink more than I wanted to drink. <laughs> my mind was making me sure, making sure I pick up the first thing. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at your own life to be able to identify that. And the two shows that I'm powerless over this thing. Mm. I had tried everything and nothing worked. And then finally, my life is unmanageable. I sat down and I made a list of how can my life be unmanageable? And I changed the word from unmanageable. I said, my life is a mess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 that makes clearer sense. It's easier to, to look for that, you know? And I said, okay, one, physically. If you look at your life physically, what is going on? And I could see I was overweight. I was, you know, there were quite a lot of things that were not okay physically with me. Even my health was not okay. And then I looked at work. And at work, things were a mess. You know, my, my, my seniors were not very happy with my work. My juniors or my subordinates were not happy with my work. You know, there were things that were said. In fact, eventually... Two weeks into sobriety, they do it, do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. And the interesting thing is that by that time, I was not drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go to exile for a whole year in another school oh. and came back after the year to start afresh. But by the time I left that school, they didn't want me to go because I was now a member of AA and I was a a responsible member of society. So, at work, it was a mess, too. And then family. It was a mess at home, you know? My mom was always complaining. My wife was always complaining. My children, you know? Mm. And then I looked at... So, finances. My finances were a mess. Mm. So, when I looked at all these things, I was able to see and connect them to my powerlessness. But the fact that I'm powerless is the one that is resulting in the mess. And when I was able to make that connection, I now knew without a shadow of that, I am an alcoholic. I am a real alcoholic. And so for a person who has doubt, there's only one thing that can prove to them Mm -hmm. That uh, the alcohol is their own track record. You have to look at your own life. Unfortunately, the toughest part of it is that you have to be honest mm. with yourself. And that is difficult because we keep lying to ourselves. And that's why it's helpful when you've got somebody else that you're working with and they can guide you through this process and they can help you in answering honestly. But once I had been totally honest with myself. I had absolutely no doubt that I meant. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous gave me. 
Right. So, <laughs> so now you are in recovery and um, it's 25 years later. How do you, how have you found living without alcohol? Um, how have you found living life, helping others stay sober? And what is it that you do on a daily basis that allows you to enjoy life and live life on life's terms? Well, maybe let's talk a little bit about the journey. Uh -huh. Where I am, because I can tell you where I am right now. I live in heaven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the big book talks about living in the fourth dimension of existence. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I know what they're talking about. The step nine promises, they talks, uh, the step nine promises say, before you are halfway through, you will know a new freedom. You, you will comprehend the word serenity and you will know peace. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I know serenity and I comprehend uh, uh, peace mm. fully. Mm. The journey that I've taken has, 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 uh, has put me there, but it's not been easy. Mm -hmm. So the first year I did my steps, basically the focus is on self. I had the pink cloud. So my head was up there in the in the clouds. And I was a little angel because there was no problem in life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd solve my problem. I'd stop drinking. So the life did not have a problem. But my sponsor was a very wise man and he said, okay, Tiliza, there's nothing wrong with your head in the clouds, but you must plant your feet on them. Mm. We've got to do the work. And so we I worked with him on, on the steps. And and I remember on my birthday, the first birthday, 12th of April 1998, I fell out of the of the pink cloud. And and I started seeing life for what it is. You know, the problems were still there, the feelings were still there, the mess was still there, and I had to do the work. And I, particularly the first five years were very difficult. The first, uh, the, the, from year two to year five, were very difficult for me because uh, my ego wouldn't just let go. But I was so determined. I was going to a meeting almost every day. I used to do 10 meetings sometimes. For me. And there was no Zoom meeting at the time. So you had to go to the meetings. People talk about balance. Uh, my sponsor said to me, uh, Deliza, that's bullshit. There's nothing like it. <laughs> you come into this fellowship, focus on recovery, mm -hmm. and everything else, as you work on your recovery, everything else shall be. Okay. You will make the time to do all the other things you need to do. And he said to me, but if you lose recovery, you've lost everything. And so that was my, you know, so I focused on just recovery and did the other things on the side. <laughs> and everything else was on the side. Recovery was priority number one. Mm. It used to make my, my wife real mad <laughs> because she was, she was priority number two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Recovery was priority number one over everything else in my life. And, and it's the truth. Because anything you put ahead of your recovery, you lose it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I focused on that. That was how I worked this. And my, I remember you remember I told you that you know, my goal was to be a saint in five years. Yes. So, so I really worked the program, but I also learned once I've done it the first time. The second time when you do the step. Mm -hmm. You do them by helping somebody else. Okay. Or step 12, carry the message to the other alcoholic. So as I took other people through the steps, 
I got a better understanding of what I was doing. I've told my sponsees that you should changing yourself if you don't work with newcomers. Because mm -hmm. it is the best way of learning more about yourself when you work with others. If you've done your own step four, when you do it again, what's going to be new? But if you're doing it with somebody else, there's a different angle you're going to gain. And therefore, the very same things you saw the first time you did your steps, you'll see them from a different perspective. The perspective of helping another person. And therefore, you gain new insights into your own challenges. Mm. So that's what I did. I, I, I went to meetings regularly. I was every rally, every convention I could go to. The first 15 years, I never missed a convention. It didn't matter where in the country parts I went there. And all the rallies that were happening, and, and they used to like inviting me to come and share. So I was at almost all the rallies, and I was going there with my family. You mm. Know? Mm. Um, because my wife was part of Alanon, and my children were part of Alatin. It just became part of our lives. We were there all the time. But tell you the truth, the emotions part was still hard. Uh -huh. My emotions were still a problem. Um, there were several things about my emotions that I couldn't deal with. One, I would still have suicidal. Uh -huh. There would be certain emotions that would be overwhelming and my mind would just take me the solution is to die. If I could just die, then this thing would be over. And, and I had that for probably up to about 18 years. Mm. But it wasn't as overwhelming as before I came into the fellowship. I could always overcome it and go past it. Mm. But it was there. And it was very uncomfortable. Resentments, they still gave me problems. Fear, that's the worst one. I was still fearful. Mm. But it wasn't as debilitating as it was in the past, but it was still quite a nag and it was a big part of my life. And so, so the emotions were quite a big challenge. And somewhere around the second, the second year, no, during the first year, I started working because I'm a teacher and I was um, at another school I started working with the kids there. I was always in the high school. And I started working with them, just talking motivational talk with them. And uh, the following year, when the schools reopened, they, so many kids came over, showed me their results, they had passed. I don't for, forget one young man who said to me, I had already this school. Mm -hmm. I think he had about a week not going to school. And he says, I was lying in bed and I was, I was thinking. And I remembered what you had said. There was a saying I used to like saying to them, I'd say, um, whatever you believe, you're dead by it. Mm. And he said, I'm believing right now. He said, I'm believing that I'm going to pay you. And he said, you're dead right. He said, but that means if I change it and say, I'm going to pass, I'm still dead right. Mm. And he says, I got up, I washed, I got into my clothes and I went to school. And he said, I wanted to thank you for that statement. Mm. And he showed me his results. He had passed his matric. Mm. And, and that inspired me to continue with this thing. So when I started off, it was just an envelope. And then I transferred it into a four, A4 four page. And then I transferred it into a couple of pages. And right now I've got a computer full of programs. But that's how it basically started, you know as a motivational talk in written on an envelope. And, uh, and so when I really got into the program, it's because I asked myself, it was one year later when I really now engaged myself fully. I asked myself the question, you know, I was looking at my life and how I felt. And I said, if you compare what I was before the program and after, it was so different. It was chalk and cheese. Mm. And I said, what happened? So that was the question I had. And in trying to answer that question, 
Then came my program. Mm. Thank you.